Welcome to Drexel and our video demonstration. This video demonstrates the insertion of a temporary transvenous pacer. When a patient exhibits hemodynamic instability due to a tachy or bradyarrhythmia, various techniques are part of the emergency physician's repertoire to restore stability. Transvenous pacing offers a temporary solution until definitive permanent pacing can be obtained, as well as two advantages over transcutaneous pacing. First, more comfort for the patient, which in turn reduces required sedation. Second, when properly placed, a transvenous pacer is less likely to dislodge due to patient movement. The viewer will need to recognize the indications for placement. This video should also help the viewer in mastering the safe and confident performance of this procedure. Transvenous pacing should be considered when there is an inability to capture during transcutaneous pacing or it causes too much patient discomfort and when there is need for patient transfer. Multiple manufacturers produce a variety of kits to perform this procedure. Our kit includes the following list which we will show at this time. Here are the contents of the transvenous pacer kit, some of which would also be found in a central venous catheter kit. Chloroprep, lidocaine, various syringes and needles, a number 11 scalpel, a guide wire. Unique to the transvenous pacer kit is the cordis catheter, along with its dilator. Thread the dilator into the cordis catheter. It will be a snug fit. This step is important to perform before gaining venous access. Here are the actual pacer and the sterile wires, an alligator clip, and then the catheter contamination shield. Additional necessary equipment for the insertion of a transvenous pacemaker includes the following. Organize and prepare the equipment for use. Either a continuous electrocardiogram machine or a cardiac monitor should be attached to the patient. Of note is the ultrasound machine to provide for best guidance in attaining venous access. Not listed, a crash cart, imperative to have when dealing with a relatively unstable patient. This is a sterile procedure, and the appropriate anatomical site for insertion should be cleansed via the typical manner suitable for central venous cannulation. The operator dons the sterile surgical wardrobe. Sterile drapes are applied to the patient, exposing only the cleansed potential insertion site. Again, ultrasound guidance should be used to gain access. We omit here simply to provide the learner with a better view. The needle is inserted until a flash of blood obtained. Two common sites for temporary transvenous pacemaker insertion are the right internal jugular and the left subclavian veins. However, there is controversy about the left subclavian as this site should typically be preserved for permanent pacemaker placement. Here we have accessed the right internal jugular vein. With one hand holding steady the needle, the wire is advanced into the vein. Cordis placement. The needle is removed and a typical cut is performed next to the wire with the scalpel. The entire cordis sheath, with the dilator in place, is inserted over the wire. Once successful insertion is achieved, the wire is removed as well as the dilator. Unlike typical cordis catheters, there's a valve at the tip of the cordis that will prevent blood from flowing backwards.
this patient's pacer is being placed for third degree AV block. The next step is to prepare the pacing wire. The pacing wire should be uncoiled onto the patient. The unique features of this wire are a protective shield, which not only protects the distal tip of the pacing wire, but maintains the curvature to successfully float the pacing wire. It is important when uncoiling the pacing wire to maintain its original curvature, which is designed to facilitate entry into the right atrium. Next, the contamination shield is placed. The contamination shield needs to be placed over the pacing wire prior to floating it into the patient. The contamination shield can be placed out of the operator's way until the pacer is successfully placed. The contamination shield should be left compressed until capture is achieved. Next, the balloon is tested at the distal tip of the catheter to ensure that it inflates properly. This usually requires approximately 1.5 cc's of air. Once proper functioning of the balloon is verified, the balloon should then be deflated. At this point, the pacing wire should be inserted into the patient. Again, follow the curvature of the wire. Advance the catheter to a length of 20 centimeters and inflate the balloon. It is important to insert the catheter wire to at least the 20 centimeter mark prior to inflation to ensure that the distal end of the wire and its balloon has passed through the entire length of the cordis catheter. The valve must be turned to the locked position to maintain balloon inflation. The balloon allows the wire to float gently into place and reduce the likelihood of intimal damage. Once the balloon is inflated, the sterile operator should open the package with the adapters that connect to the distal end of the pacing wire. Once the adapters are inserted, the distal end of the catheter can be handed off to a non-sterile operator. Ports should be inserted positive to positive and negative to negative. At this time, the pacing box can be turned on. The rate should be at least as high or higher than the patient's innate rate. As the catheter is advanced, watch the monitor for pacer spikes. The output should be started at a high level and once capture is sustained, dial back to a level in which one loses capture. Then, dial back up to a minimum output to sustain capture. Once this capture is sustained on the monitor, the contamination shield can be connected to the cordis port and the cordis secured. It is important to remember that at any time an air embolism can be introduced through an unsecure catheter. All precautions should be taken to prevent this occurrence. The sheath should connect securely to the cordis catheter. Once the sheath is secured to the cordis catheter, the entire line should be secured using 3O silk on a straight needle. As always, a sterile barrier is applied to reduce the incidence of infection. As with any upper central venous catheter placement, certain procedures should be followed. Obtaining a chest x-ray is necessary to assess for proper placement of the pacing wire in the right ventricle. Additionally, a chest x-ray will assess for any complications related to the central line insertion. A 12-lead EKG 
will show capture spikes before every QRS, ensuring proper capture. Any patient sick enough to receive a transvenous pacer requires continuous cardiac monitoring. Here is a quick review. Arrange all necessary equipment, including the transvenous pacer kit unique with cordis catheter. Insert the catheter in the right internal jugular or left subclavian vein in sterile fashion. Insert the wire to a length of 20 centimeters. Inflate the balloon. Set pacer generator to a rate greater than the patient's. 80 is usually a good starting value. Then set the output. Starting at 5 milliamps should be sufficient. Advance the pacing wire until capture occurs. Decrease output to a minimum level to sustain capture. Then slightly dial back up to a comfortable level above this threshold. Lock the contamination shield in place. Secure the catheter firmly in place via sutures.